I'm not going to speak specifically about zero suicide, but I'm going to speak about some of its parts and about closely related um, issues. And this is really, as the announcement said, a kind of a state of the union, um, or put, put differently, it's to looking at the question of how are we doing in suicide prevention uh, in the United States? And the answer to that, unfortunately, is yet we're not doing uh, so, uh, so well. And what would it take for us to, uh, 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 to really make a, a difference? And one of the paradoxes is that in, in the last uh, 20 years, the field of suicide prevention uh, is really growing. But at the same time, uh, suicide deaths are, uh, are increasing. So what, um, what could we do uh, to really begin to make a, a difference? And so the perspective that I'm going to take in this presentation is to look at other major causes of death where there's some success, that is, where the rates of death are decreasing over time, and, uh, and apply those, uh, those lessons to suicide prevention. And in particular, I'm going to look at uh, uh, heart disease, cardiovascular uh, death, where the rates, uh, a lot of people still die, it's the number one cause of death, but the rates of death have, uh, have actually de declined uh, somewhat, and I think there are some lessons that we can take from that. This is a slide that is, um, I know it's a little bit outdated, but I'm not very good at making PowerPoint slides, and so I have this around and I haven't, I haven't changed it. These patterns haven't changed that much uh, since, uh, since 2013. So this, um, uh, this slide starts at uh, uh, 2003, and it looks at the decade that followed, um, and looks at uh, uh, three or four major causes of death. Um, and this is a age-adjusted death rate. So this is the number of deaths in the in the population. And you see, at the top is the line for um, suicide. Uh, in the in the light blue green near the bottom is the rate uh, the, from heart disease. And then you have stroke at the bottom, cancer, and so-called all-cause mortality, um, which of course has taken a blow with. Uh, with COVID um, uh, this year. So <clears throat> I just chose uh, cardiovascular disease to look at because um, uh, like suicide, there are, uh, there are many causes. Uh, like suicidal impulses, uh, the, the causes of heart disease develop over time. Uh, there are a range of strategies that have been used from uh, upstream prevention to try to prevent people from ever getting in a place where they have a serious risk uh, to trying to catch them when they do uh, up to intensive intensive treatment and all those things are are true for um, for suicide as well so um, I'm, I'm trying to draw these lessons and ask us in the field uh, could we uh, could we apply them and uh, th this begins to get into the, the lessons that I think we've uh, that, that I think we've learned uh, the first thing that is happening with heart disease that is not happening yet with suicide is you can't futz around a little bit at the edges and expect big change. Um, our suicide prevention efforts are seriously underpowered. Um, it, it, you know, the zero suicide is really, if we go back uh, to when implementation started at Centerstone, uh, it's only about seven years uh, old. And uh, we've been working on heart disease a lot longer than um, um, than that. And and uh, the uh, just as another indication, at the National Institutes of Health, total annual expenditures on understanding causes and uh, and treatments and cures for heart disease are about a, a billion four a year. Uh, investments in understanding suicide prevention are about 100 million a year. So it's just way underpowered. Um, and so the a first lesson is that if we want to make a difference, we've got to take this a lot, lot more, uh, a lot more seriously. The kind of intensity of effort, and, and you all have been on a, uh, and Becky Stoll talks about it as a marathon, with uh, a lots of a serious change and attention to data and uh, training and different approaches to treatment and the kind of intense follow-up with people that are at risk uh, that we didn't really 
used to do before, if every behavioral health agency in the country were doing that, uh, my calculation is uh, we would reduce the overall suicide rate uh, by 10 to 15 percent. Why is that? And it's it's because it's very effective um, uh, on the one hand, but most people who die by suicide are not in our care. Um, and so the biggest thing we'd have to do is move out uh, to the rest of the healthcare system and, uh, and beyond that. Which takes me to a, a question about looking at uh, trends with uh, heart disease, with cardiovascular disease, what strategies have really been effective? Um, and we, we talk a lot in the field of prevention about um, you know, primary, secondary, or tertiary prevention, or to put it differently, upstream prevention, which is where we try to uh, uh, change things so that people never get in a place where they have this risk to begin with. Uh, so uh, in the case of uh, smoking, for example, uh, that would, or in the case of can cancer or heart disease, uh, smoking would be the, uh, the, the biggest one where we've actually made a significant a difference. So we can stop people from smoking. It's going to uh, uh, change things uh, that uh, ultimately put them at risk, a serious risk of a heart attack or other cardiovascular disease. And then there are preventive interventions. And the, the general logic of preventive interventions is um, we identify people who are at risk and um, we don't immediately take them to the, uh, um, um, to the inpatient unit for a transplant or a valve replacement or something like that. We try to identify them early on in their risk, and we do relatively small things uh, to reduce their risk of death. And I, th I think a, a good uh, example of, of this just comes up from thinking about um, the, the last time you had any kind of a healthcare interaction uh, was your blood pressure checked? And the answer is yes, 98% of the time. Um, the last time you had a, uh, a healthcare interaction, were you asked about thoughts of suicide? And we're doing better on that, but I would guess that th that happens these days about 15% uh, of, uh, of the time, up from near zero just a few years ago. Um, and then if we, uh, if we have some risk, there are things that we can do that I'll describe in more detail to reduce the, uh, uh, the risk. And then finally, of course, there are the people who, um, whose risk is really high, um, like you know, somebody who has a, um, uh, their, their blood pressure problems, we identify them as having high blood pressure, um, uh, they go in and get a stress test or something like that, and we see specific problems with the heart, we see that a valve uh, is not functioning, or we see that a uh, an artery is almost clogged, and uh, then it's into the hospital uh, for interventional cardiology. Um, and you might think in a way, we don't have the equivalent of interventional cardiology uh, for uh, suicide. The truth of the matter is that we do. It's very specific psychotherapies um, like, uh, like DBT, um, that are very effective in preventing uh, suicide. And sadly, they're probably harder to get than it is to get a valve replacement for a heart problem. So this logic model of thinking about upstream prevention, preventive interventions, or tertiary care is one that we can apply to both cardiovascular disease and suicide. This is my little chart um, that uh, begins to illustrate this, and I would just want to click through it, starting with uh, cardiovascular disease. There are a number of ways that we can prevent, um, uh, take action to prevent uh, cardiovascular disease in an upstream sense. And the one that I'm choosing here is preventing smoking, because it's the one that we've done the most about and we're doing the best, uh, the best with. There are other upstream uh, prevention activities for cardiovascular disease. You know, eat your vegetables and, uh, and, and lose weight and get exercise every day. And we're not doing as well with those. Um, and you just walk around the mall and you can, uh, you can see that. And so we have, we have a long way to go in that, in that arena. Um, but uh, preventing smoking, uh, we've done a lot and it's made a, uh, it's made a, it's made a difference. It's a significant uh, factor in, uh, in reducing uh, the, the number who are at risk. Um, 
But then, uh, despite these efforts, or in some cases because people don't uh, uh, follow through on this advice, um, we have uh, the, the need to identify people who have elevated risk. And uh, the biggest ways we do that with heart disease, um, as I said before, it's a blood pressure check almost every time you encounter anybody in healthcare, or every time you have a physical, um, you, there, there's probably a blood draw, uh, and you get a, uh, a lipid panel, among other things, that looks at high cholesterol and, um, um, and so on. And so the thing about it is, as I said before, these are conditions, elevated lipids, elevated cholesterol, and elevated uh, blood pressure, are things that put people at risk of heart problems down the road. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's about to happen, uh, but it means we have an opportunity to do something um, right now. And so uh, with uh, cholesterol, of course, we would try to get people to change their diet. Um, that can be a hard thing to do. Prescribing a statin. Uh, is an easier thing to do. And it's not that statins are miracle drugs. They kind of were thought of as miracle drugs when they were introduced, um, but they remain effective in reducing levels of, uh, of cholesterol. <laughs> and to give you just a sense of how <coughs> broadly they're used, the, the worldwide sales of uh, statins in 2018 were $29 billion. So uh, we're doing a lot of this. Um, and it's having some impact as uh, uh, as well. Uh, with, and with high blood pressure, which is even more a critical, a, a risk factor for cardiovascular disease than elevated cholesterol, um, our, our GP, our internist, will jump all over that as well. We're going to have to change our diet. We're going to have to change our diet, reduce salt, and there may be use of medicines like diuretics or um, um, or ACE inhibitors or, or others that are just trying to reduce this risk state that uh, the people are in. And of course, for heart disease, we've got these really high-tech interventional cardiology, things like re replacing a valve or, or putting in a stent uh, or going in and reaming out that, uh, that uh, artery that is getting clogged to prevent the, uh, prevent the heart attack. Now, we've got upstream uh, uh, health promotion activities, we've got preventive interventions, and we've got treatments for suicide as, uh, as well. <clears throat> I try to think about risk factors for suicide that are the equivalent of smoking. That is, they're, 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 they're powerful, and they really clearly lead to, to risk. And uh, th th this is what I come up with, trauma, depression, or other serious mental illness, or addiction. Uh, we know that the, the rates of, of suicidality and then of suicide attempts or completed suicide are uh, so much greater <coughs> for people with these uh, root cause um, uh, experiences um, uh, that you'll just see in looking at this. Uh, first of all, let me say that there are a lot of other things we think of as uh, you know, high, high risk for suicide that aren't really risk. That is, we know that veterans have an elevated rate compared to people who haven't served. But the rate of suicide is uh, still, uh, you know, is is still very, very low. If you look at a population of uh, veterans, it's elevated over the population in general, um, but it's uh, not elevated that uh, that much. And so that's a <coughs> something that has to do with the person's experience, but it's not really a risk factor. Um, and uh, so. The strategies to work upstream, um, I think, are the most popular strategies in suicide prevention. Um, and I'm going to raise serious questions about whether they can be effective, the way we're uh, implementing them. Um, if, we, if we did it right, if we had a society that uh, reduced the incidence of child trauma or that gave um, every child or family exposed to trauma, access to uh, competent trauma-informed care, and enough of that to make a difference, and then we could do with trauma what we've done with smoking. But unfortunately, we don't seem to have that kind of a um, uh, society. It's just hard enough to get into behavioral health care in, in, in general. Uh, there are problems of insurance and stigma and so on. So, but these 
uh, primary or upstream promotion activities uh, would be effective if we could do them um, uh, broadly. And of course, we have preventive interventions for those uh, who are at uh, at risk. And it starts with um, it starts with screening. And uh, the uh, the some people in the suicidal suicidology world have not done us a favor uh, in this regard because they uh, have this debate uh, or uh, this perspective that says uh, we shouldn't do suicide screening because we can't predict who's going to die, and particularly we can't predict when they're going to die. And I, I don't think cardiologists are going around saying that. Um, we can't predict who's going to have a heart attack, and we can't predict when, so we shouldn't try to prevent it. Um, and, and, and General medicine, if you have these risk factors, we jump on these risk factors. And it, it turns out that um, uh, screening for suicide risk uh, is way better than checking cholesterol in terms of its accuracy in preventing uh, future, uh, um, future serious health problems. Um, the, 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 the biggest study on this that I can cite is studied by Dr. Greg Simon uh, from Washington and a bunch of his colleagues. And they work in these big health systems like Kaiser, uh, where they've got uh, data on the tens of millions of people. Um, and they've got both the insurance claims data, because they're, they're an insurance company, but they've also got the, the clinical data. And um, so in this particular study, they looked at um, about 80,000 uh, people uh, who had had a PHQ-9. Uh, and they specifically looked at the answers to question nine, whether people had had recent thoughts about um, ending their life and how intense those thoughts were. And then they went back some period later, like like two years, and looked at people in this group of 80,000 who had died. What had they said uh, on their response to uh, uh, question nine? And the answer was basically bingo. The very great majority of uh, people who died by suicide had said a long time before that they were thinking about it. And so basically it turns out that prediction of uh, suicidality asking just question nine on the PHQ-9 uh, is um, as, as, as active, accurate to predict future needs uh, for care as high blood pressure or cholesterol have with respect to a, uh, a heart attack. And then, of course, if we uh, identify this risk, we've got these uh, brief interactions. Now, for people who have long-term or chronic risk, and a lot of suicide risk stays with people for some time, these are not one-and-done kind of interventions, as you, as you know. Um, but they're all uh, relatively minor. It takes a lot of effort to do them well. But it's certainly not like putting anybody in the hospital for, uh, for days and days and days. Um, so the safety planning intervention, um, and as a critical part of that, reducing lethal means, and then carrying contacts by <clears throat> phone or text or email or uh, letter um, uh, turn out to all be effective. And I'll describe in more detail the evidence on that. And then, as I said before, um, we've got uh, we we do have high end treatments uh, for suicidality where we don't just try to do these. Uh, preventive interventions, <clears throat> but we also try to directly treat intense suicidality. And of course, our uh, our treatments are not a uh, a drug. We we don't have a medication for uh, for suicidality. Now we do know that uh, for people with bipolar disorder, um, there's some evidence that suggests pretty clearly that uh, lithium will reduce suicide in that population. And there's very good evidence that uh, for people with um, uh, psychotic illness, uh, that clozapine uh, will reduce rates of uh, suicide specific for that population. But there we've got you know, two medications that are a little bit uh, complicated com compared to most of the meds we give where we write a prescription and that's it. In these cases, we've got blood draws that are involved in much more careful monitoring because these are really high, high powered uh, medications, which if used wrong, are uh, are, are are dangerous, and, uh, but they're not. Those are not medications that are uh, effective uh, at a level where we would start using them 
if somebody just acknowledges a little bit of suicidality, we should be using our preventive in interventions first and these high-end treatments for people who are um, um, uh, who, who, who really need it. <clears throat> so looking at this whole picture, um, <clears throat> what have we learned about what's worked? Um, and uh, the suicide prevention field uh, is uh, focused on upstream prevention. And this is not, like not a very kind thing to say, but I'm not interested in being kind here. I'm interested in trying to get some results. We have no chance in this country of doing upstream prevention for suicide prevention that's going to be effective at reducing the rate. I, 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 I wish we did. Uh, we know how to do that, but let's just look at what we've done with um, uh, with uh, smoking. Uh, efforts to prevent uh, smoking have gone on for 50 years. There have been over 30 Surgeon General reports. We have one report on uh, mental health overall and one report on uh, suicide. With its messaging on every single pack of cigarettes or tobacco that you buy, we have big campaigns with pictures of fruits and lungs. Um, we have regulation of smoking in public. We've eliminated uh, the advertising smoking products like the, you know, the, the Marlboro Man kind of thing. And maybe the most effective of all is you have to spend a lot more money on every purchase. And we've been doing all this for decades. And the bottom line is when you do that much for a long period of time, consistently and persistently, it makes a difference. The data that I looked at to look at effectiveness was just on, on uh, deaths, death rates within the last, let's say, uh, 20 years, going back to about the year 2000. And in, in the literature, what I see there is while these preventive efforts uh, had earlier uh, impact, in the last 20 years, the best estimate is about 25 to 35% of the reduction in cardiovascular deaths is due to upstream prevention. Um, so it's a, a really big impact, but it's a really big impact that's been achieved uh, through a, uh, a, a multimodal effort over, um, over many years. So let's look at a reality check of doing that same thing in uh, behavioral health. If we focus on these conditions that really put you significantly at higher risk, trauma, mental illness, or addiction it's it's still too hard to get care you know we still have a bunch of states that haven't um, expanded um, Medicaid just as one example of that uh, years after uh, the passage of Obamacare that made that uh, feasible and created economic incentives for that and then we have all the other barriers to care as well insurance companies that that still create artificial uh, barriers the fact that you can't in most cases uh, get uh, mental health care at the same place you go to to see your doctor, so we don't have enough collaborative care. So access to basic care uh, is uh, is hard. <clears throat> and the truth of the matter is that our, our treatments are not cures. Uh, in the hands of good clinicians, um, you, get, you get good results. Uh, but they're what I would describe as mid-range effective. You've got to stay with it um, over time. Uh, if we look, just look at medication treatment for depression, um, overall, uh, two-thirds or three-quarters of people experience symptom relief, but it might take three different trials, uh, three different medications to find the one that will work for you because uh, some work for some people and some work for others, and the brain is so complicated we haven't figured that um, out yet. And we just don't have an adequately funded uh, uh, behavioral health uh, system. Uh, so. These uh, strategies uh, are, uh, uh, there are really significant barriers to our achieving the kind of success we've had with, uh, with smoking. And of course, there are other risk factors. One that gets cited a lot is economic insecurity. We know that job loss uh, uh, and so on can, uh, coupled with other things, lead people to feeling uh, suicidal. Um, so what if we reduce those other risk factors? Uh, one study that I've uh, uh, seen in, in that regard that is kind of interesting is a study that showed that for every a dollar increase in the minimum wage in a state, 
uh, we ought to expect a 2% decrease in the, uh, in the suicide rate. Well, we're not gonna, are we going to get that done? You know, I, I don't think so. The politics of it are, uh, are uh, too great. Uh, businesses will uh, complain, um, and uh, it's unlikely to, uh, uh, to happen. Uh, so uh, it would take a major amount of work to get it done, and if we uh, got this done, uh, as, as well as other uh, risk factors, the impact would not be um, that great. And how about reducing other risk factors like uh, pain and loss and isolation? And the problem is that to some extent, these are part of the human condition and um, uh, everybody's gonna be exposed to them. And, and so creating a, a pain-free society is just not gonna happen. So um, uh, the focus of the suicide prevention field on upstream prevention is uh, very well intended. In theory, it's the very best way to make a difference, but our strategies are just so uh, underpowered that it's not gonna work. Sorry. Um, and we have some evidence on this. Uh, GLS, of course, stands for Garrett Lee Smith, which is the, uh, uh, the nation's uh, largest suicide prevention program. Of course, it's only for kids, and it's only about 40, uh, 40 million bucks a, a year. And the grants that you get, as, as you know, because you've had them, uh, last for three or five years, and they, and they go away. And GLS has been evaluated, and, and these are, uh, are the results. Basically, in communities that have had a GLS grants, suicide rate goes down, or to put it more accurately, the suicide rate levels out and doesn't go up, maybe a little bit better than that. We achieve, a, let's say, 10 to 15 percent reduction from what the suicide rate would have been. But then what happens? Uh, when the grant ends and you stop doing these things, the rate goes back up again. So that's, a, a, uh, that's evidence that if we had uh, a, a GLS program in every community in an ongoing fashion. And then if we had a, a corresponding uh, program for uh, adults, uh, we could achieve a, a reduction of, let's say, 10% uh, in, uh, in, in suicide. Um, but uh, the amount of money invested in this at the national level is, compared to everything else, it's jump change. So then looking at the data a little bit more, what has reduced the heart disease uh, death rate? Um, and if we go over to the other end of the extreme, which is how about these you know, miracle cures of conventional cardiology, of uh, valve replacement, and even heart uh, transplants, uh, and cardiac catheterization, and so on. And the data there is that these are very effective interventions. They don't work 100% of the time, but they work a very high percentage of the of the of the time and if you have one of these conditions you want this stuff it's really the, the good stuff but of course most people don't get it the numbers are relatively small uh, because most, pe most people never get quite to that uh, uh, quite to that stage and so <laughs> um, the by my estimates of looking at the actual data the reductions in the cardiovascular disease death rate that can be attributed to uh, these intensive efforts are in the range of 10 to 15 percent. So it's a really big deal if you personally need it, but it's not a really big deal from a statistical point of view. What has made a difference uh, in uh, reducing cardiovascular disease is identifying who's at risk and giving them targeted preventive interventions. So if you just think about the numbers that I've been through, or if you uh, reflect on this, the evidence suggests that in the last 20 years, about half of the total reduction in cardiovascular disease death is basically from managing uh, blood pressure and managing cholesterol and lipid levels. So the analog for that would be managing suicidality. Uh, and uh, the, the questions, of course, are, can we identify who's at risk for suicide as we can identify who's at risk for heart attack? And then do we have effective, inexpensive, and targeted preventive interventions. And I've already uh, talked about this uh, a little bit, but I'm going to go through a quick course of what you already know. If you, uh, if you work at, at Center Stone, as I've already said, uh, screening for suicide is as effective uh, as uh, screening for cardiovascular uh, disease. This is the Greg uh, Simon uh, study. So 
80% of those who responded to the PHQ-9 and then later completed suicide had said that they were thinking about suicide on, on question nine. And uh, as not surprisingly, the, the, the risk was uh, uh, tightered uh, by how often and how intensive, intensely they were uh, thinking about it. And so in this sense, from a perspective of screening, we're as good as cardiologists. Uh, we can identify um, the risk. And uh, despite the um, evidence that's starting to emerge about big data solutions and artificial intelligence, uh, the, it, it turns out that still today, the evidence-based way of uh, predicting suicide risk is asking people, asking people nice. And then if they say they're thinking about this, leaning in with uh, support and encouragement and, uh, and, uh, and tools. It's, uh, it's as good as we have in, in, uh, in heart disease. And so the, what we've got to do is make that universal. I talked before about you know, whether you get a blood pressure check and whether you get asked about suicide. And uh, we have a long way to go to make uh, evidence-based uh, screening um, uh, universal. And uh, of course, uh, I didn't say this before, but the PHQ-9, question nine, ain't a very good screener. Uh, it over-identifies people because it, it asks about thoughts of suicidality, but it doesn't talk about the other critical in ingredients that we know clinically or we know based on the, uh, uh, on the evidence are really, are, are really crucial. Um, you know, have you started to make a, a plan? Have you given much, much thought to this? Do you intend to uh, carry out this, um, uh, this plan? Um, have you done this before? And we know all those things make a, make a difference. So the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale would certainly not be only a more sophisticated way of screening for a suicide, <clears throat> but it's, um, uh, it's, as, uh, it's, as good as, it's as good as any, and I'm not going to get uh, uh, drawn into the, the, the wars of which, one is the, um, uh, of which one is the best. And then there's the... There's the ask, and there are um, and there are others, <clears throat> but the bottom line here is that uh, suicide uh, screening is uh, is effective. And then um, we get to these brief uh, interventions, um, and so the, for a long time people were starting to do safety planning, even though we didn't have any data on it, um, because uh, we didn't have any data mostly because it's really hard to do studies like this for suicide. You need really big numbers because even though suicide is common, it doesn't affect that many people. So we've now had uh, two um, uh, randomized controlled trials, sort of gold standard for medical research into, um, uh, into safety planning. This was a study that was done, I think that was published in, in 2018, but study, a big study done in a VA emergency department. So first there was screening, and if there was risk, based on the screening and based on a, a clinical interview, um, then uh, there was the development of a uh, Stanley Brown um, uh, safety plan. And uh, in this study, they did two things. They did the safety planning intervention one time in the ER. Now this again was in an ER setting. It was not in a continuing care uh, setting like a lot of uh, community behavioral health is. Uh, and um, you know, continuing care would be indicated in many cases for people, but based on the one-shot uh, development of a safety plan, and the second thing they did was telephonic follow-up. So the, this was a little bit of a caring contact and a little bit of a monitoring call. How are you doing? Uh, we're concerned about you. Do you need to, do you need to see us? And um, uh, what the study showed was a 45% reduction in uh, suicidal behaviors, basically in, in attempts. But the other thing that was really interesting is that the people who got the safety planning intervention uh, plus a, uh, uh, at least one follow-up call were twice as likely to participate in follow-up care, which is also really pretty critical because the, one of the things that we also know from, from um, evidence that's really sad is that um, because historically, our system wasn't very caring and very good about uh, suicide. 
uh, people who were suicidal were less likely to come in for care than people who who weren't. Maybe they thought they were just going to end up in a hospital, and the last time that happened wasn't pleasant behavior, or um, maybe they thought I can handle this on my own. Um, uh, I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to go in and see those people. So the, the might, might have been other barriers. But the bottom line is, if we compare compare the results of uh, this uh, this study, um, that uh, safety planning plus a, a phone call or two were better at preventing suicide than the use of statins are to prevent uh, a heart attack. Um, and I've, as I've already said, you know that statins are a, a thirty billion dollar thing. So we need a we need a thirty billion dollar safety planning um, effort, or we need to spread it much more much more broadly. And uh, you know, you all know uh, uh, about this. And if you work at Centerstone, because you use it and you you repeat it uh, regularly. And uh, but for people who are uh, naive uh, about this, who aren't 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 doing it yet, uh, this is uh, it takes some training, but it uh, doesn't take a PhD uh, or an, an MD. And uh, uh, ordinary people can get can get pretty can get pretty good at it. Uh, one of the things that I I don't think I emphasize separately, but the, from talking with Becky and also from talking with Dr. Ed Coffey, who was behind the program at Henry Ford and other places that are doing really good uh, suicide care, that one of the most critical things about it is the uh, uh, working with the patient and the family around restricting lethal means. And this is not just general lethal means restriction, but it's restricting means that have uh, a high degree of urgency because they might be fatal. Um, like uh, uh, like guns uh, or reducing means that people have have uh, thought about. We can't always take the means away, of course. If people have have talked about uh, or or say they've uh, they've thought about suffocation or hanging, um, we we can't make it impossible. But we can give them other things to do if they start to think about that, uh, like calling us or calling the lifeline or, or coming in or throwing out that particular uh, coil of rope that was in the uh, uh, in the garage, uh, and these things turn out to be effective because people's thinking, because suicide is so hard, people's thinking about how they're going to do it is often very concrete. And if we uh, take away that concrete thing they're thinking about, it's very likely to be uh, uh, to be effective. So the other, uh, I won't dwell on this, but of course the other randomized uh, uh, study of uh, this was uh, Dr. Craig Bryan's crisis response plan, uh, which is very uh, similar to the Stanley and Brown safety planning intervention. Although if you put them in a room, they say, no, it's really different. Ours is better. Um, uh, but they're, they're both really good is the, uh, is the point. Uh, Dr. Bryan's crisis response plan was also studied in a randomized control trial you can only do in the Army. Or in the active military, I, 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 can't, I don't know how you pull this off uh, otherwise, but they did a a crisis response plan or not with uh, suicidal um, uh, army members and had a, uh, a dramatic reduction in subsequent suicide behavior. And this is about 75, 75%. And then, of course, there's what we've learned about <clears throat> caring uh, contacts. And uh, uh, people always get hung up on, well, which is more effective? Is it phone calls or letters or texts or postcards or visits? Or, um, uh, but it turns out that they're all effective. Now, they're not all effective, I'm sure, for different people. Uh, I, I wouldn't try to use emails with my kids because, like I said, they don't respond to an email and I ask why. They say, we didn't text me. So um, uh, we, we obviously should be focused in on the individuals we're taking care of here. But <clears throat> caring contacts are important because they attack isolation and increase connectedness. And these are the things that are the lethal stew, the potentially lethal, lethal stew for people who are having suicidal um, thoughts. The fact that somebody is, um, uh, is thinking about me um, uh, breaks that isolation. And the fact that they've reached out to me makes me feel connected with, uh, with them. And it's interesting, this, uh, this is the only area, most of the rest of the stuff that I've been talking about, suicide care, whether it's zero suicide or even the techniques like safety planning and so on, are, are only like uh, 10, maximum 15 years old. 
<clears throat> but there was one study of um, uh, caring contacts, the original study by psychiatrist Jerry Motto in, uh, in San Francisco. And it was the, uh, we, sh we should be ashamed that we uh, sat on it for all these years. I think the study was published sometime around 1990. And uh, it, was, it was very simple. It was people being discharged from inpatient psychiatric care. And um, as, as you know, uh, the group of people that have the highest rate of suicide among any in the world are people that just got out of a psych unit because we didn't fix it there. And they're feeling bad about that. And they're back in the same situation that they were in. Uh, and one thing leads to uh, another and the, the rates are substantial. And so uh, in this study, there was randomization uh, and uh, half the group just got usual care, which is probably just referral to a therapist. And half of them made it and half of them didn't. And um, the other group got the same, uh, but they all got letters. And they got, uh, I think it was letters that were monthly uh, and then phased out over time. But um, a number of letters over a 12 to 18 month period. And they, in this particular study, they were handwritten. Uh, they emphasized uh, connection and uh, support. And over time, there was a 50% reduction in, in deaths from these, uh, from these letters. Um, and <clears throat> the, all the other research is, has been done shows that any personal means of contact turns out to be effective in reducing uh, deaths. So it's been studied with texts uh, in you know, remote areas with uh, um, Alaskan, American Indian uh, populations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Any kind of personal contact it turns out to be uh, turns out to be quite effective. Simple to do. We have to remember you may not get paid for it, but it's uh, but it's effective. <clears throat> and you all know this as uh, as well because you're even further down the road. But when we started to build the zoo suicide approach, we built the zoosuicide.com website, which um, has everything you need to uh, implement. Uh, suicide safe care, except of course for uh, a lot of really hard work and a tremendous amount of commitment. But the tools are all uh, are all there. So um, I'm going to close with some reflections on so how are we doing with uh, uh, with with all this, particularly with uh, zero suicide. <clears throat> and the first thing is we're doing very well. Where we're doing, it. and uh, I have a high bar for doing it here, which means doing it well and then evaluating. It. And so we've, we've seen at, at Centerstone, at Henry Ford, at the Institute for Family Health uh, in, in New York, at the Community Health Network in Indianapolis, we've seen uh, rates of uh, deaths uh, decline between 50 and 80, 80 percent uh, in, uh, in all these different settings. So it's, it's, it's very effective, but it's only seven or eight years old. And... Um, uh, it's still not in most places being implemented uh, systematically with quality assurance and consistent uh, training and monitoring of uh, of impact. Um, so I'm I'm hopeful in that uh, the bar is being raised. SAMHSA is fully emphasizing zero suicide in their grants, although a grant is not a good way to to produce permanent change in healthcare. It's really important that CARF has raised the bar. Uh, with respect to their accredited um, uh, organizations. But again, th they don't say zero suicide. So they, they say it's a suicide care or some variant of uh, suicide care. But the big problem uh, that we face is in the third bullet here. Um, even though it's people in behavioral health care that have among the highest rates, because most people don't get it, um, that is, most people don't get behavioral health care. <laughs> Most of the people who have suicide risk uh, are not being affected so far by implementation of zero suicide. We're starting to see implementation in other kinds of settings, but we have a long way to go. Uh, about 20 to 25% of suicide deaths among those people who are getting some healthcare visits are patients in behavioral health care. But that means 80% of the people dying by suicide who have seen a healthcare professional, it was not in behavioral health. It was an ED visit and primary care, both of which are in a range of 40% of all the people dying by suicide had a recent visit to a primary care 
physician or to a, uh, an emergency department. And so we need to start using these tools in, uh, in, those setting, in those settings. The Joint Commission has stepped up with its requirements that basically say, if you're taking care of somebody with a behavioral health condition, or if you're giving somebody a behavioral health treatment, you have to screen for suicide, and then you have to use these practical, uh, uh, practical steps. Um, and so there's progress in hospitals. Um, uh, primary care is, uh, is not there yet. Um, and the, the people who regulate primary care uh, aren't quite there yet. We have the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. So these are the guys who, if, if you're a woman, it seems like they give a different message every year with respect to breast cancer screening. If you're a guy, it seems like they give a different message every year with respect to prostate cancer screening. <clears throat> the one area where they don't give mixed messages so far, I'm a little cynical about this, is with respect to behavioral health and, uh, and specifically suicide. You know, a number of years ago, they took a position on depression is that there was essentially, if, if you're a healthcare system and you have resources lying around to treat depressed people, then you ought to train for it. Um, and eventually they've raised their bar a little bit on that. They have a project going on right now to look at suicide screening for kids. And um, I'm, I'm predicting that they're gonna end up saying, if you have the resources lying around to treat these kids, then you ought to screen and otherwise not, which is from my perspective, costing, costing lives. So we have a, a long way to go uh, in, uh, in primary care. Uh, I think back to the very first uh, Zero Suicide Academy that we did nationally, um, which was probably 2014. I can't remember um, exactly, but we had team, teams from a number of healthcare organizations. And it was almost all behavioral health, <clears throat> but there was one primary care doc who had slipped into the room. He was in Kaiser. <clears throat> and interestingly, because Kaiser is a big system, he, he, I thought he was probably a guy in a giant primary care clinic, but he wasn't. He was in a relatively small, um, small practice. And so I'm like, you know, how is all this deep end behavioral health stuff working for this guy? And so I went over to him on break and said, basically that, how's it, how's it working for you? What, you know, is this relevant for you and your practice? And uh, I thought his answer was just great. He said, uh, uh, it does work for me. He said, I, I, the way that I look at it, the risk of suicide among my patients is kind of like the risk of, risk of prostate cancer. It's, it's, Certainly not women, but um, and that's a little bit different. But otherwise, it's going to be a risk for a small percentage of my patients, um, like you know, a couple three percent. But he said, "I we've been using a PHQ two in our waiting room." He said, "I think I'm going to take that question nine, and we're going to add it to the PHQ two, and then you know, my uh, my staff will know if somebody has uh, screened for suicide, and if ninety percent of the time." Uh, I'm not going to have to do anything about it because they're not going to screen positive. But if they've screened positive, he said, that's their biggest health issue going on today. And that's what my visit is going to be about. Sure, we'll try to get to the other thing that brought them in, but I'm going to focus on how are they feeling and how are they doing. And I'm going to make sure that they get uh, uh, follow-up care. It's not going to be, uh, it's not going to be optional. So uh, if everybody in primary care had that kind of attitude, as opposed to a focus on we can't do screening because it's going to tie us up in knots, and then what are we going to do? Um, we do a little better. So in behavioral health, uh, we're starting to win in part because of the leadership of organizations like Centerstone, but we've um, uh, only just begun. And uh, with that, I want to uh, stop and uh, try to respond to questions if there um, if there are any. <clears throat>